Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. I'd like to invite you uh, to join me in a ancient uh, Easter greeting. Um, I'll say, uh, Christ is risen, and then you can respond if you feel so led to say, Christ is risen indeed. So, Christ is risen. Oh, give me a little bit more than that. Come on. I'm the one that was up at 5 o'clock in the morning for the, the lakeside thing. Come on. You guys just got up. Oh, there's a couple of you. That's right. All right. Let's do it again. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. All right. That's pretty great. Hallelujah. Absolutely. Well, welcome uh, all of you who are in the room. It's wonderful to see faces, uh, folks that we've known for so long, visitors as well. Welcome all of our friends who are also joining us online. Uh, there is a worship guide uh, that's available for you online as well. And of course, we have worship guides uh, as you come into the room. Uh, you might want to grab one of those. Uh, today is Easter. This is the, really the holiest day on the Christian calendar. It is the day when we remember uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and uh, uh, our theme today is God Heard My Cry. Uh, and Sarah's going to come in a little bit and talk a little bit about uh, what that means. But uh, Psalm 40 and a couple of other uh, Psalms, Psalm 150, there's a few other Psalms that uh, talk about uh, and, and talk from the perspective of persons who uh, are suffering injustice, suffering difficulties in their life. Um, some of it is, has just come upon them happenstance-wise. For some of them, people are deliberately trying to oppress and crush them. And one of the underlying themes, one of the underlying questions is, will God hear my cry? Will God set me on a new path? Will God lift me up? And Easter morning, Easter day, the meaning of Easter is that the answer is yes. That God will, in fact, hear our cries, our longing for wholeness, our longing for love, our longing for transformation. And so that is what you are invited into today, to consider that, um, to live into that, and to hopefully uh, practice that also as we go forth, as we leave. Now, as we prepare to enter in, we have a passage. I'd like to invite my good friend Josh to come forward. He's going to read for us. Uh, from Psalm 150, the last psalm in the longest book of the Bible, the Psalms. Psalm 150, Alleluia, we praise you, Yahweh, in your sanctuary. We praise you in your mighty skies. We praise you for your powerful deeds. We praise you for your overwhelming glory. We praise you with the blast of the trumpet. We praise you with lyre and harp. We praise you with timbrel and dance. We praise you with strings and flute. We praise you with clashing cymbals. We praise you with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Alleluia. Amen. Thanks, Josh. Friends, join me with, uh, in a moment of prayer. Lord, we thank you for uh, this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come, to be with one another, to see one another, and to be seen by one another. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will see you, behold you in a new way, and we'll know that you see us. You are the living one in whose presence we live our lives. We thank you that you are present with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I want to invite you to stand as we begin uh, our first song, Amazing Grace, by John Newton. I'd like to read a little clip written by Sarah that you can find in uh, your uh, worship guide. This song, written by a former slave trader who had an awakening to the horrors of slavery in which he had participated and ended up becoming an abolitionist. This is what grace is about in the world waking us up to become people of resurrection life. Friends, I invite you to stand as you're able. Let's sing together. Amazing. 
amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did the grace appear the hour I first believed. I have already come Tis grace that brought me saved as far And grace will lead me home When we've been dead ten thousand Bright shining as the sun We know there's days to sing God's praise And then when we first begin Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that say a red like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now. I see you may be see sorry I was uh, taking some while to come out of my grave clothes and rise up for this Easter morning so it's good to see you come on that was a really good Easter joke um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm one of the ministers here at Meeting House, and thanks so much whether you're here in person or with us online. Thank you for being here uh, to celebrate resurrection and life together. So um, before we do more, we're going to get to uh, have the kids go to God's garden, which is a time where they get to spend um, just talking about how God loves them and getting to know each other as well. So I invite you, if you are a little human and you would be willing to, come on up and we're going to sing a song all together. And if you don't know it, grown-ups or kids, you can learn it because we sing it twice through. Come on up, everybody. Here, I'll move this. Hi, happy Easter. Come on up. Hey, everybody. Happy Easter. I like all the fun clothes. Y'all, I told Josie, my kid, that I dressed like the Easter bunny today. What do you think? Did I pull it off? I just forgot my ears. Yeah, well, hi. Okay, come on up, everybody. All right, band, what do you think? All right, let's do it. Should we do it? Are you ready, kids? All right. Are you ready? Okay, let's go. Garden, gather round, come without fear. Know thy name, here in this garden, all are welcome. Yeah. Okay, right. everybody. Everybody. Come, oh, come, and come to the garden. Gather round, come without fear. Know thy name.
Okay, so on the count of three, we're going to say, by church. And then after that, we're going to echo and we're going to say, have fun, kids. Okay, so you all ready? You ready? Okay. One, two, three. Bye, Bye church! <laughs> that was awesome. Okay, on the count of three, all the rest of the church, ready? One, two, three. Have, have fun, fun, kids! kids. <laughs> okay, so out the door right over here are going to go the younger folks with Tim. And then older kids are going to go out the back following Colleen. And if you are a parent or guardian of one of these younger humans, please pick them up after the service. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that is not an easy act to follow. Um, so, uh, yes, we're talking about resurrection on this Easter Sunday, of course, uh, very appropriate. But what exactly is resurrection? Uh, I'm going to leave, uh, not say much, because I don't want to steal Sarah's thunder. She's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but one thing I think it's fair to say is that whatever it means, it's something profound and extraordinary. Um, but I think, at least from my experience, um, I sometimes feel like Easter and resurrection is a far-off country that I haven't really experienced it yet. I haven't really tasted it yet. Um, and there's a little video, actually, that uh, we want to show to you here. What would it mean to begin to experience resurrection now in the ordinary, this extraordinary reality? Even if it does feel like it's far off, even if it does feel like it's a different country and that we're not there yet. Perhaps, nevertheless, it's something that can reach into our lives now. So we're going to play a short little video for you, and we have a question afterwards. And I'll go ahead and read the question so you can just kind of have it on your mind. What might it mean to you to experience resurrection in the midst of the ordinary? In the quiet unfolding of Easter morning, may you find the courage to embrace the unknown, to navigate the thresholds of your own soul, and to discover the sacred within the ordinary. May the resurrection light illuminate your path guiding you through the shadows of doubt. And may the echoes of grace be heard in the sacred conversations with your own heart. As you stand on the threshold of possibility, may you be enfolded in the tender embrace of hope. And may the blessings of Easter awaken in you a deep sense of gratitude for the gift of life. May you dance with the rhythm of resurrection, feeling the heartbeat of the universe in the beauty of nature and the poetry of existence. soul sing the song of rebirth. May you live as a pilgrim of the heart, honoring the sacredness of every step. And may the blessings of Easter be with you always. Amen.
So now we want to give you about five or so minutes around your table to discuss our question. What might it mean to you to experience resurrection in the midst of the ordinary? About 30 more seconds and we'll come back together.
Friends, I'd like to invite you back, um, and as you're able, please stand as we prepare to sing our next song, O Dreamer, by The Brilliance. invite Michelle to come forward and read our gospel for today. We have a special thank you to y'all for leading us musically this Easter morning. Yeah. Yep. And if you didn't check, we're going to end with a, a, a banger at the end. A little lovely day. So, thanks Michelle. From Luke 24, 1 to 12. On the first day of the week, at the first sign of dawn, the women came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled back from the tomb, but when they entered the tomb, they didn't find the body of Jesus. While they were still at a loss over what to think of this, two figures in dazzling garments stood beside them. Terrified, the women bowed to the ground. The two said to them, why do you search for the living one among the dead. Jesus is not here. Christ is risen. Remember what Jesus said to you while still in Galilee? That the chosen one must be delivered into the hands of sinners and be crucified, and on the third day would rise again. With this reminder, 
the words of Jesus came back to them. When they had returned from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and the others. The women were Mary of Magdala, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James. The other women with them also told the apostles, but the story seemed like nonsense, and they refused to believe them. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. He stooped down, but he could not see, but he could see nothing but the wrappings. So he went away full of amazement at what had occurred. Thanks, Michelle. Also, um, for those of you who don't know, today is Michelle's last Sunday officially on staff, and we invite you on the 14th of this next month. We're going to have a party for her. So thanks for reading. <laughs> and Michelle might hurt me later for saying that, what I just did. But we love you, Michelle. Um, well, again, uh, Easter greetings to you this morning. You know, hearing this passage and reading it today, I started thinking a little bit about how it matters how we tell a story and where we start the story and who we center in the story. Some of you may be musical uh, fans like I am. My spouse's favorite is Hamilton. I have my own critiques of Hamilton, which you can see me about later. My favorite is the musical Six. Both of them are reinterpretations of what is often the dominant story in the way we tell. The story in Hamilton's case about the founding of the United States. It's imagined in a way of what if racial diversity had been center set to the founding of our country. Right? And then the musical Six says, what if instead of centering Henry VIII and his six wives and centering Henry, the wonderful man in history, all the women got together and told their stories and told a different story together. You can tell from my body language which one I like more of the two. Hamilton, they didn't re-envision sexism. So I, that's my beef. Just, I got it out. It's good now. It's Easter. It's telling truth time. But it matters how you tell the story. It matters who you center in the story and where you start it. So this is where, for me, as a person growing up in church my entire life, I didn't actually know that the women met Jesus first. Like, it didn't occur to me. No one ever told me that. Even though I like actually heard the text read, I'm quite sure. But it's like I skipped over it because the story was really about Jesus and Peter. Right? And it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I was at my church and this older woman came up to me and I think we were talking about, I was in a church where gender roles were really intense and women couldn't lead anything. And she goes, well, you know, Sarah, the women were the one who bore witness. And I was like, you heretic, that isn't in the Bible. <laughs> and then I went and read my Bible. And I was like, what? And it blew my mind. Here, even though I'd been reading the text, I'd been so inculcated in a particular story that I had missed part of the story. This is where Cynthia Bourgeau writes, all four gospels witness to Mary Magdalene as the premier witness to the resurrection, alone or in a group, but in all cases, all of the gospels name her by name. All four Gospels insist that when the other disciples are fleeing, Mary Magdalene stands firm. She does not run. She does not betray or lie about her commitment. She witnesses. But why, one wonders, do all of the Holy Week liturgies tell and retell the story of Peter's denial instead of Mary's story where she is unwavering? How would our understanding of this resurrection mystery change if the role of Mary were to be more deeply acknowledged? What if instead of emphasizing that Jesus died alone and rejected, we reinforced that one stood by him and did not leave? For surely this other story is as deeply and truly there in the scriptures as is the first how would that change the emotions of that day? How would it affect our feelings about ourselves, about the place of women in the church, about the nature of redemptive love? 
It matters how we tell a story. It matters where we start the story. And I wonder why, historically, we've started the story from this place, the place of Peter's denial. Have there been things or people that we might have been afraid of throughout history? Perchance. What does this say about how God shows up in the world? Well, this morning, for those of you who weren't awake at 6.30, you missed a really great sermon that's so good. I actually almost asked Christian to just preach his instead this morning because I really liked it. So I'm going to quote Christian two different times this morning so you get at least a little taste of what you missed if you were sleeping warm in your cozy beds. Here's what Christian noted, because one of the two things that he noted was, what does it mean that the women are the ones who bear witness? And he writes this. Most of you probably already know that in the ancient world, women were not given the respect that was and is due them, much like today. They were viewed suspiciously, and even in the Jewish tradition, a woman's testimony was considered less trustworthy than a man's. But as the saying goes, God's ways are not ours. God works from the margins. God is aligned with the lowly and the peacemakers, and so even in the event of resurrection, God's action is rooted in God's steadfast love and commitment to justice and jubilee. And huddled up in my blanket, I was like, amen, brother, amen. (laughs) It matters how we tell the story. So what hearing this text this morning, how might it call to all of us, whatever our gender, that it's not just the folks who get recorded in history who are the ones who bear witness to resurrection, but it's each of us in our stories and in our skin speaking truthfully, standing for justice and love, that we bear witness to resurrection and that that God loves that and that's how God shows up. Might seeing the story from this perspective give us all a little bit more courage to know that our stories matter. And how does rereading this text also remind us of the ways in which God is still speaking today? Do we look to the margins, to those who often aren't believed, and believe them, finding that God is there in the midst of their stories and truths? From the refugee to the migrant to our transgender siblings, might we believe them when they tell us of the resurrection power that they have witnessed in their own lives? It matters where we start the story and how we center the story. The second thing I wanted to reflect upon is resurrection life, which seems important given it's Easter and the passage, etc. you know. So I wanted to talk about what resurrection means. Now Merriam-Webster, you know, that, that fail-proof sort of way to, you know, check your definitions of things, says, number one, the rising of Christ from the dead. Okay, okay. Two, the rising again to life of all human dead. Uh, Three, the state of having been risen from the dead, and also resurgence or revival. Now I'll say that um, I have some concerns about some of the ways that we have dominantly told the Christian story of resurrection, right? We get to Easter, Christ has risen, and therefore now everything is vanquished, and Jesus is like a superhero who's like, but all resurrection. And like, I mean, that's cool and everything. But the truth of how Jesus rises and what happens is, first of all, as Christian also noted for us, the way that this resurrection happens isn't that kind of way. Let me say something about that, quoting Christian. He says about the resurrection that it has something to do with the character of God in the resurrection of Jesus. To put it bluntly, the resurrection of Jesus is the act of God overthrowing powers and principalities that put him to death. Jesus was committed to the way of Jubilee, God's love for all, and he was eventually arrested on bogus charges. 
So how does God respond to this? Does God send lightning bolts to strike down Herod and Pilate or the nameless and faceless crowd? Does God violently attack the powers of sin and death and the powerful interests working behind the scenes? No. God raises Jesus up in quiet. Right? Christian noted, and I'll rehearse to you, That in all of the Gospels, we don't have this story of like, oh, all of the details of every second of what happens as the stone is rolled away. No, it's in the night. The guards are dumbstruck. But it's not like everyone's gathered and is like, here's this big awakening. Jesus has risen, everyone, right? And then the women are there, and the angel shows up, and they go and bear witness. And then when the disciples eventually see Jesus, he's still got wounds, the wounds of a resurrected person who had been crucified. And I think this matters because sometimes we can employ our faith and spirituality to kind of take us out of the struggles of this world and just be like, one day I'm going to be with Jesus and Jesus is going to mighty conquer everything. And the reality is that that keeps us from letting Jesus care for us in the suffering and the realness of our own lives, and in the suffering of our neighbors. To just be able to be present, knowing that this is part of the promise and the power of resurrection. It's that God is with us no matter what we face. And yes, indeed, death has been vanquished in Jesus and he rises, but there's something much more vulnerable about it. And it doesn't prevent us from experiencing suffering in this life, right? There is still injustice and people crying out, and yet part of what resurrection bears witness to is that it doesn't have the final word. I think this is important so that we can actually live resurrection life. I read a quote from James Baldwin this last week that really hit me. He wrote, life is tragic simply because the earth turns and the sun inexorably rises and sets and one day for each of us, the sun will go down for the last, last time. Perhaps the whole root of our trouble, our human trouble, is that we will sacrifice all of the beauties of our, beauty of our lives. We'll imprison ourselves in totems, taboos, crosses, blood, blood sacrifices, steeples, races, armies, flags, nations, in order to deny the fact of death. It seems to me that one ought to rejoice in the face of death, ought to decide indeed to earn one's death by confronting with passion the conundrum of life. One is responsible for life. It is a small beacon in that terrifying darkness from which we come and to which we will return. It's a sense of we all die That's true. That's part of our stories. There will be suffering. And yet the resurrection hope and promise is that that's also not the end of the story. That we are held in love from beginning to end ourselves. And that this promise is God is with us and is here with us whatever we suffer or endure. And that at the end, love always wins. And so it challenges us then to continue the work of being human of following Jesus in loving our neighbors as ourselves. This is where Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his letters and papers from prison notes that these kind of redemption myths where we just think Jesus will vanquish everything and we just want to live there, they arise from the human experience of boundaries. But Christ takes hold of us in the center of our lives. We say God is big enough to hold whatever we encounter or endure, and yet often we can live a faith that's like, I don't got any problems. You don't got any problems either. Welcome to church. Amen. Are you good? I'm good. Amen. Right? And I think Jesus wants more for us. To be able to go into the terror of our own lives, the things that we fear, the things we're sure will kill us, and discover, I'm still here. I might be walking wounded but let me show you my scars and you show me yours. 
And together, let's walk and keep journeying towards love because we know that that wasn't the end and the things that were supposed to kill us, they're not going to win. This is the power and the beauty of resurrection. The things you are sure will kill you, they have lost their sting. And even if literal people want to kill you, they won't win in the end. Resurrection means life not just for us, but it tells us something about how the kingdom of God works and the fundamental truth and directionality of history. Sure, it's true. Violence reigns. Empires colonize and dehumanize. People commit genocide, but this will not win. And this gives us courage to live, to act, to continue to pursue justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God and to love because we believe that at the end and beginning of all things, the God of all love is with us and that resurrection life is for us. And it gives us the courage to live. So might we live resurrection life? A life that is grounded in that early morning promise of a God who shows up in the world in tender ways and walks around with wounds, but whose love is unending and will never cease. And might we follow the way of Jesus in this. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, resurrection is the promise that death and the things that we're sure will kill us is not the end of the story. God, you know the realities of each of our lives where we are in deep need of resurrection, where we are longing for it, where we look for it. You know that both in our own stories and throughout the world, the places where people are crying out, longing for resurrection life. So God, we pray that Easter would bear witness to us and to others throughout this world that the forces of death, that they do not win. And may that give us courage to love no matter how dark the night, no matter how beautiful the morn. And in this way to embody the prayer that you taught us to pray, that our lives would say, your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. May you be risen here indeed in our lives. Amen. Well, for our breathe out, which is a time of really saying, okay, so how do we embody some of this? Like what's the takeaway sort of thing? I had one of our community members that shared um, some of their poetry with me. And when I read it, I was like, this sounds like Easter morning. So um, they were very kind and willing to share that with us. So I'm going to invite Millie to come up. And um, Millie is going to say just a couple words about the piece, and then we'll read it for us. So let's welcome up Millie, because it is a brave, courageous thing to (laughs) share your work in the world. So hi, happy Easter. Thank you, Sarah. Come on for your over. Leadership. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm turning on the mic. Um, it's it's very humbling to share and be well received. And um, welcome to everyone. Um, if you're visiting, I'd like to personally welcome you and then invite you back for more. Um, faith isn't built on one Sunday. I'd try showing up for twelve and see what happens. Um, the piece I'm going to share, I actually wrote twelve months ago in a few days. And in that time and space, I was grieving my mother. I was having all these amazing spiritual things happen in my life. And along with those spiritual things, there were also these dark spiritual attacks that were happening. And it really opened my eyes to the spiritual warfare that exists in our world. And if we fast forward to July of last summer, I had my birthday. 
and it was my first year that I would know that my mother would not be there to celebrate. And I went to church and saw friends and spiritual friends and um, then met a, a faithful friend for brunch. Another friend canceled, which ended up opening up my whole day um, in large part. I didn't really have any plans. And I decided to be a tourist in my own town. And I went to the Cathedral of St. Paul. This was undoubtedly inspired by studying abroad and seeing many cathedrals in Europe, an idea that was my mother's. Never underestimate the groundwork you are doing as a person of faith, because those things that happened all those years ago laid the groundwork for this idea. And so I went to the cathedral, I walked around like a tourist would, and then I sat down and I felt so tired. All the self-care things I tried to do did not work to get me out of whatever darkness had attached itself to me. No amount of sleep, no amount of clean eating, no amount of going to the gym, giving up alcohol, none of it worked. I sat for three hours in prayer. I prayed to God, and then I said, who does he enlist? I prayed to St. Michael, and then coming from a family of faith, as I had been taught growing up, I prayed to, this feels like a stretch, my ancestral angels. And I sat there in prayer because I had no idea what else to do. Within a few days, I was awoken at approximately three in the morning. This is not like me. And I watched this dark spirit leave my bedroom. Never underestimate the power of prayer, of leaning into her faith, even if it is just of that mustard seed that we hear about. Since that night, that darkness that had overcome me has never returned. And I am proof that your faith, your hope, and love in God can do amazing things. And if you would like to talk later, um, I have enlisted myself to be up here after the service if you need prayer. And if any one of my friends feels called to come up here and pray for, pray for others, you're welcome to join me as well. Um, this is called Matter. If what happened never was, if what I overcame, if what you've overcome, I didn't need to overcome, you didn't. I wouldn't know or appreciate, you wouldn't, the difference in timing, the difference of divine planning, of divine timing. If I had coasted along, if you had coasted along, without worry or distress, how could I appreciate, how could you appreciate the work in my life that's brought this new time and space. Time and space needed for creation. And we are the matter. Scientifically speaking, creation is always working. And no matter what you've done, and no matter who you've been, you can be remade. You can be renewed. A new creation. You are a new creation. You can be a new creation. If you want to be, if you want to be recreated, you can be. This is the time. You are the matter. The life that you've lived can be shattered. A new lifetime awaits. You need not worry about fate. This is the time. You are the matter. The moment, now. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Thank you so much, Mary. Well, I just want to then send us all with a question thinking about Millie's poem. If resurrection life is the promise that this is the time and you are the matter, and you can be recreated and reborn, what holds you back? 
from living and embracing this hope and promise and possibility. This is the time you are the matter. What holds you back? With that, I'll invite Christian to come up and share a few announcements with us before we get to our last song. Don't you mean before we get to deviled eggs? <clears throat> Excuse me. No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, we have different palettes, right? Uh, yeah, so I have a few announcements. So one is uh, yesterday we had a wonderful event here. I think this is now the fourth year in a row of the extravaganza. Is that right? That's, yeah, she said, sure. That sounds about right. <laughs> Uh, and I had a, we had a privilege to come over and, and be here, and there were hundreds of kids. Um, so we have a little video for you to check out uh, all the happenings and doings. Uh, here we go. It was as fun as it looks. Let me tell you, the only thing I, it's too bad they don't have shots of the, um, the kid-friendly archery, because I would have liked to have seen that. Um, anyway, I digress. So a couple of other announcements. One is uh, we are starting back our Wednesday night programming this week um, on April 3rd. Uh, this week we're gonna gather and offer to you an opportunity for service learning. Uh, from 5.30 to 6.15, we're going to be putting together care kits for some of our mission partners who are focused specifically on community care. And then from uh, 6.30 to 7.30, we will hear from leaders and others who are involved in some of the work of those ministry partners. Those partners include Freedom Works, Southside Family Nurturing Center, the Whittier Wildflowers, preschool and young life so if you have the opportunity the chance i really do want to invite you to come wednesday nights we try to set aside a time for a meal and also a learning experience and so this will be a, very much a hands-on opportunity uh and then in april april 18th uh from 6 30 to 8 8 o'clock uh we will have our uh next jesus and justice or faith and justice gathering together uh, Rachel Whiteman will be coming to talk to us about her book, uh, Faith and Fake News, uh, a guide to consuming information wisely. And, and so I think it's fair to say, obviously, we're in the midst of a political season and the issue of discernment and truth and truthfulness um, is constantly not only in the news, but it's also a key virtue for Christians uh, to be people who speak the truth um, uh, and do so in love. And so we're hoping that uh, Rachel will guide us through her a discussion of her book. Uh, and then that will actually be the, the week of, or no, I guess it's the second week of our discussion of the book. So on Wednesday nights after uh, April 3rd, starting on April 10th, we will actually be reading the book for about three weeks together. Uh, last but not least, I do want to point you to the uh, uh, the. Are these, what, is, what kind of fabric is this? Is it a felt? The velvety bags. Those are places if you want to continue to uh, support financially the ministry of this community, uh, please feel free to put uh, your offering in there. If you have prayer needs, you can also put that in there as well. Uh, there are also other ways to give. You can give online. You can give mobily uh, using uh, your text uh, on your phone, etc. So with that, I would like to invite you to our final song. I uh, invite you to stand as you're able. And we're going to sing. And I think this, I hope this will be, you'll be humming this in your head for the rest of the day. Lovely day. Yeah. Hey, we might need your help to sing this one. In the, you know, that lovely day party. We need help with it. Thank you. 
When I wake up in the morning, love, and the sunlight hurts my eyes, and some don't with that one in love, it's heavy on my mind. Then I look at you, and the world's alright with me. Just want to look at you And I know it's gonna be uh, Alright, here we go A lovely day A lovely day A lovely day The day that lies ahead of me Seems impossible to face When someone else instead of me Always seems to know the one Then I look at you Just want to get you And I know it's gonna be A lovely day A lovely day A lovely day When the day that lies ahead of me Seems impossible to face When someone else is there of me Always seems to know the way Then I look at you And the world's alright with me just want to get you And I know it's gonna be Come on now A lovely day Lovely day, lovely day, lovely day yeah. A lovely day I don't know about you, but I think it's going to be a lovely day. <laughs> thank you so much, y'all. Uh, well, thank you so much for celebrating uh, Resurrection this morning together. Uh, just a couple notes as we go. The one is that my spouse has texted me, and I have an editorial correction. Hamilton is not his favorite musical. <laughs> I'm sorry, Andy Garber. His favorite musical has come from away. Second is uh, the Book of Mormon. So there you go. That was important information <laughs> for this Sunday. Uh, the second is, just to say, there's coffee and donuts. If you would like them after the service, if you're here in person, if you're at home, enjoy whatever you eat, maybe some deviled eggs. Yes? <laughs> And the third is this blessing. This is from Christine Smith in Risking the Terror Resurrection in This Life. Resurrection as process, not moment. Resurrection as neighborhood and community transformation. Resurrection as bodily integrity. Resurrection as refusal to play cards with the jailer. Resurrection as insurgence and resistance. Resurrection as coming out. Resurrection as remembrance and presence. And resurrection as that which we practice. 
May these images lead us to claim and name every conceivable expression of resurrection that is among us. So may you go in the resurrection promise, and may we be people who live resurrection in this life. Go in peace and in love. Amen. Thank you.